By the morning of the 14th of October 1942, Paulus had managed to reinforce Xylus' 51st Army Corps with the 305th Infantry Division and elements of the 14th Panzer Division, which gathered in the mountain village area. These units were not at full strength, perhaps 20,000 men in total, but neither were the opposition. And it's clear, just by looking at the map, that Paulus' third offensive was about to overwhelm the Soviet defences ahead of him. Group Yenica would lead this attack. This consisted of two divisions, 389th and 305th Infantry Divisions, plus parts of the 14th Panzer Division and elements of 24th Panzer Division. It had 83 panzers and 31 assault guns from the two Sturmgeschütz battalions. Heim's 14th Panzer Division would spearhead the assault, and the aim was to take the brick factory and everything north of there, including the tractor factory. Strangely, the Germans would be helped in their mission by Chuikov. It turns out that Chuikov wanted to conduct an attack on the morning of the 14th of October, just as the Germans launched their own attack. Nobody had ordered him to do it, even though he later claimed that they had, so the idea for this attack was Chuikov's and Chuikov's alone. Others have tried to say that this was a tactical innovation to get the troops as close to the Germans as possible, to strike at the throat. But there's a difference between preparing to defend yourself close to the enemy lines and preparing to attack close to the enemy lines. In reality, it was a misjudgment on the part of Chuikov. And since they were in a position to attack rather than defend, it explains why the subsequent events were so disastrous for the Soviets. So, at 0600 hours, a two and a half hour bombardment of artillery and carpet bombing from 1,250 aircraft, including every Stuka that Richthofen had, battered the Northern Factory District in what may have been the most intense bombardment of the entire battle. Over 2,000 sorties were conducted, and 600 tons of bombs were dropped, which explains why the Soviet communications network collapsed. Chirikov later wrote that the water in the Volga boiled from the explosions. I've endured plenty of bombardments and artillery preparations during my life, but I'll always remember the 14th of that month. You couldn't hear individual shells going off. No one was counting the planes. You could leave your bunker and not be able to see five meters ahead of you because of all the smoke and dust everywhere. One of Chirikov's staff officers wrote, it was no longer possible to see the sun, only a sad brown circlet peeping through the clouds. Spumes of earth, fire and smoke rose up around us. There was just a rolling, thunderous wall of noise. Sitting in one's trench, you felt that no one could be left alive, either around you or behind you. That everything was being consumed in this terrible bombardment. Watching from the German side, Hull was so mesmerised by the bombardment that he wasn't paying attention to the Soviet counter-battery fire. A Kachusha rocket smashed into his command post and masonry fell upon him. Apart from some minor injuries though, he was alright. His helmet and an oven that had been between him and the rocket had saved him. But others were not so lucky. At 0730 hours, the German assault began. Group Yenica struck from the Schnellhefter block to the northeast, overwhelming everything in its path. After carving their way through the lines of the 109th and 114th regiments, the German avalanche fell upon the 524th Rifle Regiment, which was in the second echelon, dug into bunkers and machine gun nests, offering stiff resistance. But with support from several Sturmgeschütz and the 305th Pioneer Battalion, Gunkel's and Vinzer's regiments made short work of them and took the tractor stadium. So the 524th and 109th regiments were overrun, with two battalions from the 109th being encircled and destroyed, and the 576th Infantry Regiment was surging northwards. The headquarters of the 4th Battalion of the 149th Rifle Brigade, plus Amelchenka's staff, ended up becoming encircled in a building known as the House of Professors, the building of which was now filled with wounded soldiers. And the 385th Rifle Regiment tried to counterattack, but was spotted setting up for this attack, and was therefore hit by Stukas and artillery strikes. Together with the other regiments of the 112th Rifle Division, they therefore dug in as best as they could, However, the threat of this attack persuaded Gunkel not to go further north. 
Vinza, though, continued to advance into the buildings west of the tractor factory, and the Soviet line was definitely split open now. With all cohesion lost, the surviving elements of the 114th Guards Rifle Regiment fled back towards the tractor factory, chased by 14th Panzer Division's units. To make matters worse, Zolodev's command post was swarmed by German bombers, and contact with his units was lost when an explosion buried him alive in his bunker. He survived, but he had to await rescue from the outside. A signalman called Viruchkin, possibly from Churikov's staff, helped dig him and his team out, but the signalman was then killed later that day. Gertiev's headquarters also suffered a similar fate, with over a dozen officers killed, and the commander of the 308th Rifle Division had to be pulled out of the rubble by a relief squad sent by Shmekatorov of the 193rd Rifle Division. After nearly an hour, the relief squad tumbled into Gertiev's dugout. Old friends, the general and the colonel, fell into each other's arms and wept. To the south, 577th Infantry Regiment, with Schulter's Panzer Unit from 24th Panzer Division, moved east, overpowered a Soviet anti-aircraft battery, and split the 90th Rifle Regiment from the 118th Guards Regiment, thrashing both of them in the process. The 90th Regiment was down to 15 men from the 41 that it had started the day at. Yes, it was already on its last legs before the start of the day. And the 161st Rifle Regiment suffered serious casualties while defending the area around the ruins of the Illich Hospital. In order to hold the line against the drunk Germans, the regiment had to launch a counterattack, which soldiers Petra Popov and Alexei Kabanov participated in. Kabanov being the one describing the Germans as drunk. Petra Popov recalls, Then in the midst of the din of explosions, we heard a piercing whistle, the signal to attack. The commander managed to shout out, for the motherland, for Stalin, hurrah! But we did not see him again. Everyone hurled a grenade to his front and jumped up out of cover with the shout of hurrah. The fascists, unable to withstand the pressure, fled. Unfortunately, Kabanov was hit in his arm and his back by a German grenade and carted back across the Volga later that evening. And the 161st Regiment weren't the only ones to counterattack either. Belay's 84th Tank Brigade was thrown in to prevent the Germans reaching the Brick Factory or the Volga, as was the training battalion of Gorishny's division, and the 42nd Rifle Brigade was in this area too. But this action on the southern flank had little bearing on what was happening to the north, as the whole of Group Yenica surged towards the factory. The anti-tank artillery regiment, attached to the 37th Guards Rifle Division, was attacked by one Luftwaffe plane, causing the men to hide in a ditch. Then the panzers appeared and simply shot up the crewless guns, wiping out the regiment. With little in their way, 14th Panzer Division's spearhead crossed the railway line and broke through into the tractor factory itself, which Heim said happened at 3pm. Guardsmen and militia forces put up a spirited defence inside the factory, but it was clear that they were only delaying the inevitable. The works quickly became a charnel house. Millions of shards from the enormous glass skylights in the roofs littered the concrete floors, and blood smeared the walls. Cannon shells and tracer bullets ricocheted through cafeterias, and Germans and Russians lunged at each other across chairs and tables. Shortly after fighting broke out in the tractor factory, the encircled 416th Regiment of 112th Rifle Division was wiped out. Reacting to these events, Gorokov was ordered by Chuikov to redeploy two of his battalions from his western flank and move them to the tractor factory. More orders came through to redeploy the 115th and 2nd Brigades along and south of the Mechketka River. This was probably a sensible move, since there needed to be a line on the southern flank of Group Gorokov, but it also weakened Gorokov's western flank, which was already in jeopardy. By this point, Zolodev had gotten out of the dirt, and was desperately trying to re-establish communications with his troops and figure out what was going on. 
After some time, they realised that some of their men were surrounded in the house of professionals, others were surrounded in the bread factory, and more were surrounded elsewhere too. It's not stated why, but Zolodev then made his way back to 62nd Army's headquarters to report in person to Chirikov. Zolodev finished his report, and there was silence for a few moments. His soldiers had fought with astonishing bravery, but the odds against them were simply too great. The 37th Division had been overwhelmed by the might of the German onslaught. Yet still, its men were resisting. You could almost touch the emotion in the room, Rakitsky recalled. Apparently, Commissar Gorov hugged Zolodev, then Chirikov hugged him too, telling him that he believed in his division and that he knew Zolodev would be great. But embracing each other wouldn't get around the fact that the day had been a complete disaster for the Soviets, with Chirikov later describing the 14th of October as his most critical day. By now, Yermolkin's 112th Rifle Division was down to around 1,000 men, Zolodev's division only had one combat effective unit left, and Chirikov now had to try and piece together his army, with German forces just 800 metres from his command post on the western bank of the Volga, itself under fire. He had to send his own headquarters security staff to form part of the line to the north, and he begged Zolodev to go back north to command it. German bombs then struck his headquarters, killing 30 staff members and totally disrupting the army's wire communications with its subordinate divisions and regiments, many of whose command posts had also been destroyed. This compelled Churikov to use generally unreliable radio communication to monitor and control his forces. On the 14th, our army headquarters lost 61 people, but we still had to stay there. This had been nothing other than a rout. In fact, the Germans had only captured 436 Soviet soldiers, including deserters, which means that the majority of the men had either died or fled. This was perhaps why Chirikov resorted to draconian measures to keep his men in line. He shot a regiment commander and his commissar, plus two more brigade commanders and their commissars too, telling the troops that there could be no retreat. Many were shocked, but the message was clear, not one step backwards or else. This, though, didn't stop the survivors of the 109th Guards Rifle Regiment, all 26 of them, from fleeing and eventually crossing over to Zaitsevsky Island on the Volga. It was clear that the Germans had taken a giant step forwards. While Churikov claimed that the Germans had taken 3,000 killed, this was definitely an exaggeration. The 14th Panzer and 305th Infantry Divisions had only lost a combined total of 538 soldiers, 9 tanks and 13 assault guns, many of which were repairable. Glantz also estimates that Churikov had lost more than 10,000 men on the 14th and 15th of October, which probably means he had suffered a good 5,000 casualties on the 14th, if not more. Beaver confirms that Soviet losses are unknown, but Churikov notes that 3,500 wounded were taken back across the Volga on the night of the 14th, so it must have been significantly higher. It's no wonder that there was a command crisis in the 62nd Army that evening. Michael Jones, in his book Stalingrad, How the Red Army Triumphed, explains that there was, indeed, a crisis of command in the 62nd Army on the most critical day of the Battle of Stalingrad. And it is perhaps the only book that really talks about this in any great detail. Chuikov gives his excuses, and the other books that do mention it all go along with what Chuikov said, which is interesting because even before I read what Michael Jones wrote about it in his book, it was obvious to me that something was off with Chuikov's account. Here's what he says. During these hours of fighting, Paulus did not have a single fresh battalion he could throw in to make a dash across the 300 yards left to reach the 62nd Army command post only 300 yards, but we had no thought of withdrawing. Then, two paragraphs later on the same page, he writes, Telephone wires were being blown up and in flames, not only on the right, but also on the left bank of the Volga, where we had our emergency command post. This caused us particular anxiety, because the bulk of the armies and the entire front's artillery were on the left bank. 
I asked the front commander for permission to send several sections of the Army HQ to the emergency command post on the left bank, on condition that the entire military council stayed in the city. We wanted to be able to administer the 62nd Army from the left bank, in case the Army commander post was destroyed. So, which is it? In one breath, he says that he had no thought of withdrawing. But then, two paragraphs later, he says he did want to withdraw across the Volga. So, he did want to withdraw. Also, the excuse he gives is that it was difficult to administer the army from inside the city because he was under bombardment, and he was losing communication with his units. Except, he also said that the command post on the other side of the Volga was also under fire. So, Chubikov inadvertently admits that withdrawing across the Volga wouldn't have improved the situation much, if at all. Therefore, according to Chuikov, he had no thought of withdrawing, and therefore asked Yeremenko if he could withdraw to a place which probably wouldn't improve the communication situation, but would put him on the other side of the Volga, coincidentally at a time when it looked like his army would be overrun. Plus, we know that Chuikov's headquarters had been under bombardment previously, way before Palace's third offensive, yet he never asked to leave the city before this time. So, doesn't it seem very coincidental that he chose the exact moment when he lost most of the northern part of Stalingrad and looked like he was about to be overrun to ask if he could withdraw from the city? Without even reading any of the other sources, just reading Chuikov's account alone, it's blatantly obvious that Chuikov wanted to get out of the city to save his own neck. But none of the other books, apart from Michael Jones's, explain it like this. First, they say that Chuikov realised that there was no point sending units to the north to protect the tractor factory because all he was doing was reinforcing a defeat, something Chuikov says the page before. Chuikov supposedly told Khrushchev this, then decided to concentrate on defending the Barricade and Red October factories, which Khrushchev agreed to. Chuikov also requested more ammunition before the army perished, which Khrushchev promised to send him, therefore admitting that the army was on the brink. Then they say that Chuikov asked Yeremenko and Khrushchev if he could withdraw his command post from Stalingrad, a request, they say, that was promptly refused. But they give no additional context to this. Worse, Michael Jones reveals that it actually happened differently to the way Chuikov describes. In reality, when Chuikov spoke about communication problems and asked if he could withdraw, this was actually the second time he asked if he could withdraw, and that he first asked for permission to withdraw before his conversation with Khrushchev. So... To clarify, Chubikov asked for permission to withdraw at 21.30 hours on the 14th of October 1942, then spoke with Khrushchev later on that evening, and then he asked to withdraw again on the 15th of October, which was the request he recorded in his memoirs. So, Chubikov had neglected to tell us about the first time he asked for permission to withdraw, then said that he had no thought of withdrawing, and then told us about the second time he asked for permission to withdraw. In other words, Chuikov wasn't telling us the true story. Well, let's try and figure out what actually happened. Here's the first withdrawal request made by Chuikov at 21.30 hours. The army is cut in two. Our HQ is 800 meters from the enemy. Control of the fighting is only being maintained through the radio transmitter on the left eastern bank of the river. The telephone cables keep being cut. Our communications are breaking up. I am asking your permission to move to the emergency command post on the left eastern bank tonight. Otherwise, command of the army is impossible. With the request for withdrawal coming before Chirikov spoke with Khrushchev, Michael Jones doubts that the conversation with Khrushchev was really a fact-finding phone call, and was more likely to be a reaction to Chuikov's request to withdraw across the Volga. But it's the 62nd Army's order at 0100 hours on the 15th of October that gives us the most striking clue about what happened. Michael Jones explains... At 1am on 15th of October, the 62nd Army War Diary recorded the issue of Military Order No. 205. Combat orders gave instructions to the various divisions of the army, and they took a consistent form. 
They were always issued on the authority of the Army Council. Chirikov as the 62nd Army's commander, Krylov his chief of staff, and Gorov the commissar. This procedure was absolutely standard. However, Order 205 was not issued on the authority of Chirikov, Krylov, and Gorov, but quite exceptionally on that of Krylov and two of his operational staff, Ilizev and Zaligzuk. This order was the one which formed the line north of the Barricade factory, so it was a very important order. Jones says that it was inconceivable that it wouldn't be released under Chirikov's authority. Isayev says that Chirikov removed the 92nd Rifle Brigade with just 147 bayonets from the line and marched it north to the brick factory area. He notes that it hadn't reached their new positions by the morning of the next day, which wouldn't help matters much, but the point is that if the order to move this brigade came from Order 205, then it probably wasn't Chirikov that did this. It was Krylov and the other two staff members. So, what does this mean? It means that Chirikov wasn't in command of the army at this point, but Krylov was. As Jones explains, Order 205 may well point to a remarkable, undisclosed sequence of events in which, following the phone conversation, Khrushchev and Yeremenka decided to dismiss Chirikov as commander of the 62nd Army and replaced him with Krylov. Such a decision would mirror the fate of Chirikov's predecessor, Lopatin, who was also removed from his command during the battle by the Stalingrad Front for attempting an unauthorized withdrawal on the grounds of military expediency on the 6th of September 1942, and again was replaced by Krylov. So Chirikov had been sacked by Yeremenka. Now, it's not clear exactly why he was reinstated, but the most plausible theory is that Stalin intervened. Stalin hadn't been happy with Yeremenka's performance. On the 13th of October, he had, in fact, told Yeremenka that the front commander hadn't supported Chirikov enough. Stalin had specifically sent a bunch of reinforcements that were meant to go into Stalingrad, but Yeremenka had kept them on the eastern bank of the Volga. He therefore instructed Yeremenka to go into Stalingrad to speak to Chirikov and get a true picture of what was happening. This hadn't happened yet, but the point is that Stalin wasn't happy with Yeremenka's performance, and it was Stalin's wish that the city didn't fall before the Uranus counteroffensive had started. It's likely that, having heard that Yeremenka had sacked Chuikov, Stalin stepped in and rescinded the order. This actually explains why Khrushchev phoned Chuikov in the first place. Khrushchev was looking for confirmation of his own analysis of the situation. He went on to remind me that Stalingrad now had not only strategic, but even more important political significance. Whatever happened, we must hold it. It was clear from the conversation that Stalin was also worried about the position of the city and was obviously asking the Front Military Council and Nikita Khrushchev in particular to clarify the situation. Then Chirikov asked a second time to withdraw across the Volga. However, the way he described it in his memoirs isn't the way it actually played out. When he asked permission to withdraw, it was rejected by Yeremenka, but then Yeremenka also said that he would send the 138th Rifle Division into the city. Michael Jones explains that this was an admission that Yeremenka had previously kept units on the other side of the Volga and hadn't sent them over to Chirikov, which Stalin had wanted him to do. The influx of new soldiers and the orders from the top kept Chirikov in his place, although, as we'll see, tensions were still high and nerves were still strained. So, let's just put all this together. On the 14th of October, Chirikov saw that the northern portion of his army was disintegrating and lost his nerve. He then made an excuse about poor communications and asked if he could withdraw across the Volga. Yeremenka sacked him from his post, along with Gorov as well, maybe, but Stalin intervened, blaming Yeremenka for not supporting Chirikov enough. Khrushchev then rang Chirikov to clarify the situation and ask him what he needed. And Krylov issued Order 205 without Chirikov's authority, indicating that Chirikov wasn't in command of the 62nd Army at this time. 
Chuikov then asked for permission to withdraw a second time, but Yeremenko told him that he was sending in the 138th Rifle Division into the city, and therefore refused Chuikov's permission to withdraw. And at some point before the fighting began on the 15th of October, Chuikov was reinstated as commander of the 62nd Army. At first, I wondered whether Chuikov was just putting pressure on Yeremenko and the high command to give him reinforcements, rather than it being the case that he wanted to save his own skin. But from the evidence, it appears that Chuikov genuinely lost his nerve. The disintegration of his northern forces, the rapid loss of the tractor factory, and the fact that he had nothing to plug the gap with, had got to him. And there's further evidence surrounding this event that confirms that this is the case. In another account, Chirikov said, On the night of 14th of October, I shot the commander and commissar of one regiment. After a while, I shot two brigade commanders with commissars. Everyone was immediately taken aback. We bring this to the attention of all the soldiers and the commanders in particular. If I had gone beyond the Volga, they would have shot me on the other side and had the right to do it. The situation dictated, and it had to be done. Chuikov was saying that if he had gone beyond the Volga, because he knew in hindsight that he had asked for permission to withdraw, he knew that he would have been shot had he crossed the Volga, which was why he was repeatedly asking permission to withdraw rather than just fleeing. He then told his brother, who was working with him in his headquarters staff, in the late afternoon on the 15th, that the next 24 hours will be critical for order. One of us has to get out of here alive. When the Germans break through, I will take my machine gun and make a last stand at the Volga's edge. I'm not going to surrender to them. I will die fighting. I will never leave this city. This shows a couple of things. First, that Chuikov believed that the Germans would break through, and that the situation was lost. That's why he said when the Germans break through, he would make a last stand at the Volga's edge. He believed the situation was lost, proving that he had lost his nerve. Secondly, he knew he couldn't retreat because he would have been shot, so he evidently decided to die fighting, which explains why he was willing to shoot his subordinates who didn't stand and fight, because his only chance was to keep his men in line. Chirikov then pulled out an envelope and gave it to his brother, saying, Could you bring this to Valentina, Chirikov's wife? It's a letter to say goodbye to her. Fyodor, when you cross the river, wait. The Germans have to strike us hard before the reinforcements get through. Look out and see whether we are still here tomorrow morning. If we are, come back to us and destroy this letter. If we are still here tomorrow morning, consider that we are winning. He also summoned an artillery commander from across the Volga and informed him that they expected the Germans to overrun their headquarters any minute. He told him to prepare his battery to fire on the 62nd Army's headquarters when the Germans arrived. And there's more evidence beside this, but you get the picture. This is why, in my opinion, shared by Michael Jones, it's likely that Chuikov had lost his nerve. Of course, after the war, he knew that there would be a record of him asking to leave, and he had to make up some excuse to mitigate the damage to his reputation, plus the fact that the Soviet Union was known for its censorship. It is fascinating to compare Chirikov's memoir against the harsh reality of actual events. It would have been very painful for him to acknowledge publicly that, however briefly and understandably, he had lost his belief that the defence would hold. All military memoirs were heavily edited and rewritten in the Soviet period, and it could never be openly admitted that Stalingrad might have fallen to the enemy. Chirikov therefore made his excuses in his memoirs, saying that it was all about communications and administering the units. But then, as is often the case when trying to distort history, he contradicts himself, saying that the situation was just as bad on the opposite side of the Volga. And this is why I keep saying contradictions usually mean there's a distortion of history, so be on the lookout for them. And this is important because all you hear in these memoirs, or in the Soviet accounts of the battle, or many of the other history books, is that the 62nd Army bravely held on, and that Chuikov was the right commander for the job, and knew exactly what he was doing from the start. Well, the events around the 14th and 15th of October 1942 paint a slightly different picture. 
Chirikov hadn't been so certain of victory, and was unsure whether his army could hold on for much longer. He wanted to get himself out of danger, and there are other clues in the narrative that suggest that he was losing control of the situation, which we'll see in the coming days. He might even have been panicking a little. But, panicking or not, it didn't change the situation. Palace's third offensive was in full swing, and things were only going to get worse for the Soviets. Outside the city and prior to the German attack, Stalin, Rokossovsky and Yeremenko had discussed what they could do to relieve pressure on Chirikov's forces. Rokossovsky and Stalin had come to the conclusion that another attack from the north of the city would have to go in, although they decided to wait until the Germans attacked first. Well, now that the Germans had struck, the Soviets responded by launching multiple attacks at the Serafimovich bridgehead, where they tried to draw German forces away from Stalingrad. It didn't work, but it did catch Hitler's eyes. He responded by issuing an order to boost the defences south of the Don, including the construction of fallback positions. Hitler also said that the Soviets had no reserves left, and that if the Germans could successfully defend over the winter, they would finally destroy the Red Army in 1943. Well, those defences would be put to the test, as Yeremenko ordered that the 7th Rifle Corps and the 90th Tank Brigade should now reinforce the 64th Army for an attack which was planned for later in the month. Thus, pressure was mounting on the German flanks. And as we just heard, Yeremenko had promised to give Chirikov the 138th Rifle Division. So, Chirikov now ordered the 650th Regiment of that division to cross over the Volga and take up positions in the tractor factory by 0500 hours on the 15th. Unfortunately, a shortage of weapons prevented it from moving over the river this night, leaving Chirikov with nothing but the ghosts of depleted divisions to halt Paulus's third offensive. This was why it was important for the 92nd Rifle Brigade to move north. However, something I didn't mention in the previous part is that its current commander, Striegel, had refused to move. It's not clear why, but he was arrested and replaced by a political officer called Nikitin. Perhaps, though, Striegel had been right, because, also overnight, the 305th Infantry Division's 577th Infantry Regiment advanced across the railroad, captured the brick factory, and reached the bank of the Volga. In the process, they encircled and destroyed the reinforcing 92nd Rifle Brigade, with only 12 men surviving of the 147 that had marched north the day before. Also, by the morning of the 15th, a battalion from the 103rd Panzer Grenadier Regiment had reached the Volga south of the oil depot, and the entire southern part of the tractor factory was within German hands, even before the day's actions had officially begun. Then, at 06.30 hours, the Luftwaffe swarmed over the northern parts of the factory, plus the nearby settlement areas that were still in Soviet hands. And at 0700 hours, artillery opened up at the same time that the German assaults went in. The Germans expected heavy resistance, but their fears quickly evaporated, as they found little in their path but the odd token defence here or there. One example was the trains of the 680th Railway Battery, which were quickly destroyed near the factory. The crew had to flee across to Zaitsevsky Island to escape the German advance, and it only took two hours, until 9am, for Vinza to capture the rest of the tractor factory, as the dregs of the remaining Soviet units fled north. Gunkel's regiment, though, had to contend with resistance by the 112th Rifle Division, but it wasn't long until they had cleared the Soviets from the south of the Metchetka River, and 112th Rifle Division fled north with its remaining 118 men. The 1st Battalion of Gorokov's 124th Rifle Regiment, sent south to help out, was also destroyed south of the river, with only 12 men making it back to friendly lines. Thus, by the afternoon, the Germans had mopped up the entire area between the Brick Factory and the Machetka River, and had once again split Churikov's army in two. Churikov's 62nd Army appeared to be on its last legs. All it could do was wait for the Germans to strike south. Anyone capable of shouldering a weapon was shoved into a frail defensive line north of the Barricade factory. 
Gorishny's training battalion, the dug-in tanks from Bailey's 84th Tank Brigade, Churikov's security forces from his headquarters, and the remnants of the 118th Guards Regiment successfully blocked the approaches to the Barricade Factory. And, by the way, if you guys want to read a more detailed account of the fighting that I've just described during this episode, I would recommend Jason DeMarc's book, Into Oblivion, which focuses on the 305th Pioneer Battalion, but mentions a lot of the action that the 305th Infantry Division was doing. There's a lot of individual actions and stories that I simply can't cover in this series, so check it out. But one thing I will say is that I get the impression from this book that a lot of the casualties taken by the Germans on the 14th and 15th of October 1942, at least for the 305th Pioneer Battalion, were suffered from Soviet artillery rather than direct combat from Soviet infantry. So even though Chirikov's army was in trouble, its artillery was still giving the Germans a real headache. Something to bear in mind. Of course, the Soviets were suffering more than the Germans. Both Zolodev's and Gorishny's divisions had lost 75% of their strength by the 15th of October, and the 84th Tank Brigade had lost 18 of its tanks. The 24th Panzer Division, on the other hand, had actually managed to increase its tank strength, going from 25 to 26 Panzers. Although the 14th Panzer Division had lost 19 of its 40 tanks, so it appears that both sides lost roughly the same number of tanks. But, as planned, Huber now ordered his units to destroy Soviet forces north of the Mechetka River. After a three-minute artillery and rocket bombardment, the 267th Regiment of 94th Infantry Division advanced against Spartanovka from the west, while Group Krumpen attacked Renok and Spartanovka. German grenadiers riding on tanks struck the Soviet lines, but were repulsed by anti-tank guns and infantry throwing Molotov cocktails. To the north, the pioneers of Kampfgruppe Strelka advanced into the buildings of Renok and fought a bitter battle in the streets and houses there. It barely got anywhere though, and 16th Panzer Division reported heavy casualties filling up its dressing stations. Huber was frustrated by 16th Panzer Division's failure, ordering Pfeiffer's 94th Infantry Division to hurry up and also attack towards Spartanovka on the 16th. Gorokov was busy sending frantic messages to Chirikov and Yeremenka, telling them that his ammunition was running out and that his pocket would be wiped out unless he received reinforcements. Chirikov also received requests from the remnants of the 112th Rifle Division and similar units in the north, asking if they could withdraw across the Volga. They claimed that they were wiped out, which was untrue, although Chirikov didn't know that. Still, Chirikov rejected the order. His army was on the brink. However, the 650th Regiment of the 138th Rifle Division was finally able to cross the Volga overnight on the 15th to 16th of October under a hail of artillery and stook of fire that somehow didn't destroy a single boat. It was sent to reinforce the defences north of the Barricade Factory. The 650th Rifle Regiment, though, only had 1,067 men at this time, so this wasn't much of a reinforcement. Still, it was better than nothing. Hitler was pleased that the tractor factory had fallen. But when Richthofen flew to Hitler's headquarters to show the Führer photographs of Stalingrad's ruins, he learned that Hitler had wanted to release 200,000 Luftwaffe personnel to the army in order to alleviate the manpower crisis. Goering, though, persuaded Hitler to use these men to form 20 Luftwaffe field divisions instead, which, of course, would be under Goering's control. Richthofen was appalled, saying that these men should have gone to the army. Apparently, as well, during this time, Hitler considered making Richthofen the new commander of Army Group A. But nothing came of the idea. That evening, Paulus ordered Zeilitz to regroup his forces and conduct a general assault towards the Barricade Factory the next day with the 14th Panzer and 305th Infantry Divisions, supported by the 24th Panzer Division. 389th Infantry Division would, meanwhile, mop up the remnants of Soviet forces in the Tractor Factory and nearby villages. Paulus' force in this area had around 10,000 men, 70 tanks, and 18 assault guns. The Soviets had less than 6,000 men in the area, supported by just 20 tanks from Belay's 84th Tank Brigade. 
and it's clear that they were at a disadvantage. The 37th Guards Rifle Division had been so mauled in the previous fighting that the entire division was now consolidated into its 118th Rifle Regiment, and the 650th Regiment of the 138th Rifle Division had to be inserted into the defences east of the stadium to give the Soviets a hope of holding on. But manpower wasn't the only problem. Paulus had a limited amount of time left to finish the job before his forces ran out of fuel and ammunition. His rear services reported on the 14th that they had basically no fuel reserves left. And on the 15th they reported that they only had about three more days worth of ammunition supplies. So basically, if Paulus didn't win by the 18th of October, he would have to stop his offensive, which would grant the Soviets another opportunity to rest and regroup. Could Paulus smash through the thin line that Churikov had erected north of the Barricade Factory? Could he repeat the success he achieved in the north, but this time in the center? And could Churikov hold on, or would his brother be sending that letter to his wife? We'll find out next time. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.